Uh, this presentation is going to be on um, monitoring production JBoss with JBoss Operations Network. Uh, my name is Mike Croft. I'm from the Managed Services team here at C2B2. Uh, and this uh, webinar is going to hopefully introduce the concept of monitoring to uh, those people that are unfamiliar. Um, to go over JBoss Operations Network um, as a specific monitoring tool and uh, just a little bit about how that can improve your business operations. So, who am I? Now, I've told you my name, but uh, I'm part of the managed services team um, at C2B2, which provides deep support for Java middleware. Now, part of our remit is to proactively support customers with their middleware infrastructure, and that includes uh, educational webinars just like this. So, this is targeted towards um, not just our customers um, or prospective customers, this is towards anyone uh, who would like to employ a more proactive approach in their infrastructure. Um, you may be familiar with some more general aspects of monitoring, uh, but perhaps not familiar with Java specific monitoring or, or JBoss Operations Network in particular. Uh, so to kick us off, uh, what is monitoring? Well, at the uh, lowest level, a lot of people will be um, familiar, whether they know it or not, with uh, OS level monitoring. Now, many Java apps currently re rely on operating systems level monitoring tools in uh, businesses. These include things like Windows Task Manager, Process Explorer, um, and you can get information about the processes that are running um, and where they came from, the um, libraries that they're using. Uh, but often this monitors the wrong sort of information. Uh, just by way of an example, the amount of memory used by the JVM process will simply be the size of the Java heap. Uh, and from that in Task Manager, we would have no idea of how much of that heap is actually free uh, or any details on perhaps the, the split between nursery and tenured objects or any details about garbage collection. Uh, so in a nutshell, with OS level monitoring, uh, you'll miss out on key information. You'll know that your server's gone down, but not necessarily why it went down. And this is where JMX steps in. Uh, JMX stands for Java Management Extensions, uh, and it's a Java standard API, um, so it's very widely used, and includes information on the JVM itself, like, as I've mentioned, data on heap size, um, uh, GC operation, uh, thread statistics, all of which will completely miss out with uh, OS level monitoring. Uh, and these are exposed with mBeans, so the applications that you write can take advantage of this API to be manageable through JMX enabled monitoring tools. Uh, so how does John use this data? Well, JBoss Operation Network is just uh, one of many tools which use the uh, JMX standard. Uh, J John in particular will use data gathered via JMX API to um, allow for monitoring. Uh, it will show you data for all key processes um, of the underlying infrastructure. It provides uh, alerting options, um, so you can see that it provides support for incident availability and problem management. Uh, now, the key thing here is that it enables businesses to be proactive to support things like service level agreements. Uh, you can see that your server looks unhealthy before it goes down, for instance. Uh, it allows for operations um, as well, so actions can be taken in response to incidents and problems. So if it does get to the stage where something goes wrong, um, you can have an automated system to, uh, to cope with that. Uh, it does also allow for change management, uh, integration with uh, service desks for notification and incident management, um, but that is a little outside the scope of what we're looking at here today. So just a little bit more detail about um, John in particular. Um, those things that I've mentioned just now are really that they're common to a lot of monitoring tools. Um, or we'll implement those in various different ways. Um, and obviously because I've mentioned them in this presentation, John implements all of them. Um, so specifically then, a lot of you will have heard about JBoss Operations Network or in the guise of RHQ. Now, RHQ is the unsupported by the vendor upstream product. So, John is positioned as the more stable enterprise release. Now, both products are very similar, so what applies to one will more often than not apply to both. 
Uh, now that means that it's always a good idea when checking documentation online. Um, if you've got John, check RHQ as well. Um, most of the information online will apply to both, uh, and it's always worth checking um, both sources before you move on. Uh, John is a, and RHQ is a combination of a server based on an embedded JBoss application server and a collection of agents which are usually installed uh, per machine. So each agent will um, gather data via plugins um, on the uh, applications that you've got installed on that machine um, and report back to the server. Now plugins are the driving force behind John. Uh, there are plugins available from Red Hat um, that come with John and that come with RHQ. Uh, not all of the ones that come with RHQ are supported, so you won't find all of those in, um, come with John. Um, and they're configured to monitor common jar for applications, uh, so for, for instance, uh, databases like uh, Postgres, um, application servers, ESVs, um, all that very common tools um, are the ones that are supported. Um, they do also um, supply generic plugins, so just a generic database plugin, for instance. Um, and this is especially useful if you have um, some sort of exotic JMX supporting database that doesn't have a plugin already. It allows you to have a point from which you can uh, extend your plugin to uh, support more databases than um, are supported from RHQ uh, from Red Hat. Uh, and the only prerequisites are a supported database and Java. Now, currently, the only supported databases at the time of delivering this webinar are Postgres or Oracle database, though it is possible uh, to use either SQL Server or RH RHQ or John's embedded database. It's not supported uh, by Red Hat, so it's not advisable to use either of those in production. Uh, so now just a little on um, gathering metrics in John. Uh, now, first of all, if you are unfamiliar with um, this sort of monitoring tool, you'll need to know what metrics are available before you can decide that you want to gather them. Uh, now, some things are quite obvious that you'd want to um, gather. So, for instance, um, memory usage. Um, a big disaster in a production system is... Uh, uh, an out of memory error, for instance, brings your entire applications to a halt. Um, users can't access the applications that you're providing. Uh, that's something that you want to have um, configurable metrics on, so you can see it, is my server using a, a high amount of memory before it gets to the out of memory error, um, and you can see historical reports. Now, as I've mentioned before, JMX enables John to expose information on the operation of the JVM. Uh, but all this data actually goes very deep down, uh, even to individual components of applications that you may have deployed uh, to your app server, for instance, or your ESB. Now, what it comes down to is how that application makes use of the JMX API and the plugin that John uses to interact with the metrics exposed by the application. So, just to clarify that statement a little bit, um, each application, whether it's um, an application that you've deployed yourself to the database or an app server. Um, each will implement uh, parts of the JMX API themselves and um, depending on what they make available, um, plugins can be used to interact with that information. Um, because this is so widely used, there are a huge amount of um, metrics available. Um, they vary per application, as I've said, and even per plugin. Now, it is possible to include support for JMX in your own applications, so you can write in um, exposed uh, services and, and data in your own applications, um, but it is very involved, and again, it's far outside the scope of this uh, webinar. Configuring them, well, John makes it very easy to configure the gathering of metrics by listing all of those which are available to the plugin uh, and allowing you to you to decide at the uh, time interval for gathering data on each. So uh, when you're actually looking at John, looking at the um, admin console screen, uh, you'll see that there's a list of all of the different um, 
pieces of data that you can uh, gather. So um, the maximum response time for um, a particular application. Um, you might find that um, a particular application gets hammered at a certain time of the year or a certain time of the week. Um, you can monitor the uh, maximum or average response time uh, and make decisions on how to um, uh, adjust for that and predict those sorts of um, variable uh, usages of your applications. Um, off the back of that, it is obviously very useful to be able to uh, configure alerts of these metrics. Now, I've mentioned um, alerts on uh, heap size and memory usage. I've mentioned alerts on response time, um, or mentioned gathering metrics on those things. Um, that's often not particularly useful if those metrics are gathered when you're asleep in bed. So how can you use John to alert you to the fact that something is going wrong or is in the process of um, failing or under high usage and um, having performance adversely affected? Well, uh, in the context of John, an alert is simply a notification that one of the metrics currently being measured has met all or just one of a set of given conditions. You can set these conditions um, uh, when you um, create your alert, um, and you can decide whether you want um, a very complex alert or just a simple one um, based on one, um, one piece of information. Um, and also, depending on how critical you feel that alert is, um, different sort of notifications can be set. So for example, uh, you wouldn't want to be notified every time an event gets written to the log um, by email. That will very, very quickly fill up your email inbox. Um, and a lot of the important alerts are going to get lost in the noise. So uh, it should be noted that notifications don't have to be set. Um, every alert will appear in the dashboard. Um, there's a big long queue uh, of every alert that happens, um, but on, you don't. That, that will happen whether or not you set a notification. Notifications are a separate thing, whereby um, an email could be sent, a script could be executed, um, and even alert scripts can be written and configured by the user. So anything that uh, John or RHQ doesn't provide, you can simply write your own um, alert script to provide that yourself. Uh, setting new alerts, well, an alert can be set for any available metric. So if you can measure it and see it on the um, on a graph in a metric, or if it's something that you can um, schedule to um, be gathered, then that's something that you can set an alert for. Uh, and you can set an alert for different sorts of actions that happen on that metric. So again, talking about memory, you can set it to um, alert you if memory usage of the uh, tenured heap goes above a certain level or the nursery heap goes above a certain level. Um, you don't even have to do it with that level of granularity. You can do it across the entire heap as well. Um, so there's a lot of fine grain control that go, goes along with um, setting alerts. Uh, now these trigger actions uh, are basically a specific type of notification uh, and they can be set for each alert. Um, multiple ones can be set or none can be set. Uh, it's very flexible. Um, but the real power with this sort of um, triggering is that um, multiple alerts can be set to re um, to remove other alerts and to re-enable other alerts. So um, just to give you an idea of uh, where that might be useful, uh, one use case might be that an alert is set for disk usage above 90%. Um, so that's uh, getting towards quite a critical level. Um, now that alert is going to keep going off at the time interval that you set. So if the metric is gathered every 10 minutes, uh, then the alert will be fired every 10 minutes. Um, now what you can do is then disable that alert after the notification has been sent that this critical thing has happened so that you don't get every 10 minutes a new alert on the queue uh, and find that Again, you get the same problem as before, where the bit of information is critical and useful, um, but it's creating a lot of noise. 
Uh, but the problem, obviously, with disabling an alert is that now the next time that happens and the next time it's a genuine problem, you won't get alerted. Uh, this is where the real power of uh, setting these sorts of trigger actions comes in because you can then set another alert um, which will monitor the disk usage for going below a certain level, um, back to normal usage levels, for instance. Um, and that can then re-enable the initial disabled alert. So um, you can see that setting up two alerts back to back that way, uh, you can avoid being notified more than once for any individual event. Uh, so now just uh, briefly a little bit about um, diagnosing and triaging issues. Um, now I was hoping to um, do a little demo here, but unfortunately we've had a few technical problems like I've said, so um, unfortunately I'm not on the machine that I was on, so I can't show you a demo of these things. Um, just a, a quick overview of some of the sorts of things that are very common in uh, business applications, some of the things that we see uh, very often a, a cause for great concern for businesses. These are the sorts of um, the sorts of problems that can occur that really impact your performance will um, really be noticeable by your end users uh, particularly. Um, so just to kick us off with slow memory leaks, um, these are the sorts of things that are very subtle problems to diagnose, even to spot. Um, very often with um, enterprise level middleware, memory leaks, if, if they do occur in the middleware itself, it's um, quite significant and quite obvious that it's not your applications that are causing it. Um, memory leaks that happen in your applications may be a little bit more subtle, a little bit more tricky to, uh, to diagnose, especially when you've got um, tens or even hundreds of applications running on a server. So looking at a slow memory leak, what we really need to do is look over a historical large amount of data. And what John will give you is a graph to show you um, the heap usage over time. Um, you, you can specify the sorts of things that you want to be graphed. Um, so you can see how uh, perhaps your tenured heap isn't being reduced during global mark and sweep garbage collections. Um, this sort of thing uh, is often an in indicator that um, when your tenured heap doesn't ever um, decrease in size that um, you know may maybe there are a few um, hard references in your applications that need to be um, redressed and made to be weak references so, so that the garbage collector can collect these objects. Um, John provides um, uh, graphs, uh, detailed uh, graph tabs. Now with each different um, metric that you can configure per JVM and for each aspect of the JVM, you can then add these graphs to either your um, JVM monitoring tab or you can even add it to your global dashboard if it's a very um, uh, a very important, very vital um, server or JVM that you're looking at, you can add it to your dashboard just to um, give you an extra level of um, of clarity there. Uh, for poor performance, uh, this is something where you want to be able to monitor uh, CPU usage. Uh, and John does not only show you um, details of Java applications and Java um, uh, Java metrics. It will also show you um, some of the OS level diagnostics that I mentioned previously. Um, so it will show you uh, CPU usage per core. It will show you um, details on your file system. I mentioned um, a disk usage use case earlier. Um, and this sort of um, noticing of poor performance um, also ties in with usage patterns. Um, you can configure metrics, um, like I mentioned, about response times. So um, each time 
you get um, an unordinately long response time for um, a request from an end user. Um, you can easily spot with historical graphs um, the generic usage pattern that might come with this. For instance, if you were um, a betting company um, and you were trying to implement live betting with live odds during a football match, for instance, um, you will easily be able to see um, you know, during different times of the match whether response time really drops down um, to an unacceptable level. Um, you can then sort of uh, include triggered alerts to um, do something about that, to notify someone who can then change something in the server. Um, similar to um, being able to react to um, a denial of service, um, whether it's an attack or it's just a high volume of requests, um, these alerts can be set to execute a script. Um, and as I said before, you can configure your own notifications for each alert, and your notification might be this script. Um, if you're running an elastic configuration, um, one of my colleagues at C2B2 has uh, written a blog on this recently, um, which you can find on our website, um, about using an elastic infrastructure. These sorts of alerts can be configured to reorganize your, um, your cloud server, give it more memory, give it more CPU power for the length of time that you're seeing high volumes of usage. Um, and if it is a, a DOS attack, you know, it is something that's malicious, you can always reconfigure a firewall to block packets from a certain address, which is sending you um, a large number of requests. So now that uh, I've gone through gathering metrics, configuring alerts, and uh, the diagnosis and triaging of issues, uh, I'll just give you a little demonstration of um, the power of uh, John when used to monitor particularly JBoss servers. So this is the uh, main screen that you'll be presented with on um, installing John. Um, we've got our dashboard here which uh, can be configured um, and we'll have a look at that when we go through. Um, the uh, key thing to look at is really the inventory. Um, so we'll just open that up. Uh, down the side we have our resources. Uh, there's a discovery queue for those resources that we have plugins installed for um, that have detected um, maybe a, an application server or a database that exists on the, the system or uh, the system where the agent is installed um, that haven't yet been added to the server to monitor. This is where you'll find them. Um, there's a grayed out import button at the bottom there that can be used to uh, import all the desired ones. So if we look at all resources, you can see just the sheer wealth of uh, things that are available to you in, in John. This is really, really fine-grained stuff here. Um, really goes in quite deep with the, uh, with the system. Um, looking into platforms, we'll get um, a slightly more tidy view, if you want to call it that. Um, so this is the machine that I've got it installed on. Um, clicking on that will give me... Um, a view of this machine. Now each agent that you install on a different machine will give you this sort of view of um, on a per machine basis so that we can look in and um, have a look at what's going on and um, really get a lot of control over what we're viewing um, and organize it in such a way that it doesn't look quite such a mess as when we look at everything all in one view. So uh, to start off with we'll look at uh, application servers uh, this is just the RHQ server. This is the John server that I've installed. Um, as I mentioned before, RHQ and John are fairly interchangeable. RHQ is the upstream version, but you will still see it uh, referred to as RHQ in, in certain situations like this one. Um, so in the actual John server, it comes with an embedded application server. Um, and that's what this is showing us. So clicking on this will take us to... Um, the server overview uh, and you can see we've got a similar dashboard as we had for the um, machine overview that I was just on. Now we've got different uh, resources. All these different resources and measurements are different per plugin. 
so for each metric that you want to um, install it's um, it's going to be quite a good idea to have some way of finding out what it is that this plugin provides so if we look under the monitoring tab we can see what our schedules are now these schedules are just a list of all the things that are available and whether or not we're monitoring them so when you're looking to gather new metrics or think about what sort of things you want to monitor this is a great starting point now you see that my collection intervals here are quite small uh, that's just for demonstration purposes so that I can have a lot of data to um, to give you obviously you wouldn't want to collect quite so often especially not on a production server um, but down the left here we have the name of the metric um, a brief description of what it does um, this option here will tell you whether it's enabled or not um, and the collection interval uh, to enable new metrics um, simply um, select you can either click enable or disable down here or you can change the collection interval so I'll change that from 20 minutes to 10 when we press set it will automatically be enabled as you can see there now uh, for alerts we get a similar thing we get a dedicated tab um, as you can see I've got no alerts on this server as yet uh, so let's have a look at um, the definitions tab Now this is where we can add new alerts so I'll just take you through that process quickly um, I'll just call it my new alert um, priority medium enabled yes when it obviously when it gets created you want it to start up enabled um, there are certain circumstances where you might not want it to start up enabled if um, if your business needs um, require that but for, further on the flow we want to check all of these tabs uh, and make sure that we've set things otherwise the alert will be um, useless at the moment we've we're firing an alert when any of zero conditions are true so we'll need to add a condition uh, now again each of these is going to be different for, um, not only based on the plugin but based on the uh, particular resource within that plugin um, so you can see down the left this uh, JBoss application server plugin gives you the server overview it gives, shows you the alert subsystem um, gives you a lot of JVM stuff which we'll go into in, in a minute um, it shows you things per application and we can set things at that level of granularity um, and each um, view of that for each alert will get different conditions available here um, so just like with the monitoring tab it's an awful lot to remember um, and it's always worth just having a, a check and noting down things that you might find useful in the future even if you don't want to set up an alert right away on that thing um, so just to carry on through this uh, example um, what we'll, we'll set um, a condition on availability change so we want to know when the server goes down we'll press OK um, a notification at the moment um, none are set now that doesn't mean that you'll never see an alert um, if you were to click back into the dashboard um, there's an alert window there which will um, which will show you all the alerts that you've got configured and when they get triggered the notifications are much more dynamic um, sorry they're much more uh, proactive than that they're not just um, something that's passive and that will wait for you to come and uh, have a look at it you can set actions that will happen um, again these are all configurable these notification senders um, to system users will um, only give you a list of um, registered users at the moment just the RHQ admin super user is available we can send direct emails uh, which gives me an email box um, so for example if it's a very serious alert then perhaps we'd want to send an email to um, the uh, the IT manager um, who can then make decisions based on that um, and there are other things like uh, CLI scripts um, which we'll look into um, shortly um, and other different uh, notifications there um, so I'll just add a system user one 
Now, if that doesn't have any sort of email or contact details set in the RHQ admin um, user profile, then that's not going to do much um, notifying. So it is always good to make sure that the um, users are configured correctly if you want to use that sort of notification. Uh, recovery alerts. Um, I actually mentioned um, earlier in this uh, this webinar. This is the uh, the option to disable the alert when fired or not. Um, so obviously you don't get m multiple alerts for the same thing. Um, now you might notice that um, this drop down box here just says none. Um, what will appear, well, which I will show you right now, um, is if I save that alert um, and then create another one. Once it loads, um, then we'll be able to recover that alert after disabling it. So um, under this uh, recover alert box, now we've got the alert that we just created. So now when this second alert gets fired, my new alert will be re-enabled. Um, now if you remember that we've got this in the general properties to start one enabled or start one disabled, um, that's the sort of situation where you might want to start one disabled. Okay, so uh, just moving on to the uh, diagnosis and triaging of issues. Um, I'll just revisit uh, a few of the things that I've mentioned previously uh, when talking about the slides. So um, for slow memory leaks, I mentioned um, it's always good to have a look at the JVM, um, particularly uh, historical data on the memory subsystem. So you can see for each level of the JVM, we've got a lot of um, things for the memory to, to look at. Um, now you'll notice that the... Um, the tab that I was just on persists across different uh, aspects of the uh, of the John console there. So do bear that in mind. If uh, something comes up and it's blank, that'll be why. Uh, so here we've got uh, committed and non-heat committed measurements. We've got uh, graphs on that. Those can be clicked, and um, we can configure how how fine details we want to look at that. So this is just the, the last hour that this has been running. Um, obviously this server isn't really doing much, so there's not a lot to look at on this graph. Um, but when you're looking for slow memory leaks, you really need to look at historical data, and this is where you'll find it. Um, so looking further into the actual garbage collection uh, data, this is the mark and sweep section, which is obviously going to be what's um, acting on your tenured heap. So we can see the collection count per minute has spiked twice in this little graph. And it correlates with the collection time per minute. So this is going to be mark and sweep only collections. It's not going to include uh, these two graphs. It's not going to include um, scavenger collections, which is um, on the other metric there. Here we've got the collection time per minute, so if you've got any mark and sweep which takes a particular length of time, um, let's just increase the um, the range there. So now we can see earlier mark and sweep collection times, we've got a, a slow one there, and they're gradually increasing. Uh, that's because I started this server uh, not long before that first mark and sweep that you can see on the graph, so that's what we would expect from that sort of data. In terms of uh, poor performance, we'll need to look at um, CPU data, first of all. Um, so under operating system information, under JVM, we can see the behavior of our um, CPU time um, in terms of processing. Uh, we can also see um, physical memory and uh, swap memory that we'll use for um, for particularly the, this JVM in particular. Um, now, when you're looking at poor performance and also, uh, I mentioned usage patterns, um, it's going to be good to be able to look at um, 
uh, things which will you know will affect your system based on business logic. So the example that I used was um, uh, live betting on a football match. Uh, now that's likely to be just a single or maybe group of applications. So looking under applications and web applications here, this uh, root.war, this is the console that we're looking at currently. And we can see we've got um, maximum servlet response times, um, request serves per, serve per minute, obviously not many because uh, this is just the John server itself. Uh, we can see that all these graphs will give us um, historical data. Again, going back into the monitoring tab, we've got this um, graphs selection here, which will load up and give us um, a more detailed graph. We can get um, specific times of each of these um, events that have been fired here. Uh, and obviously you can see there's just two graphs here, but in the summary tab there was multiple. So if I wanted to add a new graph, simply right click, hover over measurements, and we can add um, the graph to the monitor view, and we can even add the chart to the dashboard. And the dashboard is the main dashboard for the console, so when you first log in, uh, that's what you'll see. And if it's a particularly um, hot application that you're doing a lot of work with, you'll want to see things like... Um, perhaps requests uh, per minute. So we'll add that graph to this monitor view. And once it refreshes, we've got the third graph. Um, but obviously you can see there's no metric data available because that's not been configured yet. And finally, I'll just recap on the um, simple DOS defense. Um, now when I was talking about alerts earlier, um, I mentioned that you can um, notify with scripts. I'll just show you that once more to refresh your memory so that it's um, in front of us. Um, so we call that script alert. And under notifications, here you can see you can add a script. Now, where you would want to um, create your scripts is here. This is the example script. Now, this can be found in uh, the path above there. So this is my uh, JBoss home, um, and I've installed my John server under the John directory. Um, and it's just in the John server home slash alert scripts in the same folder as your slash bin directory. Uh, inside there you'll find this example.rb which is a Ruby script um, and just a simple example of um, how to send an alert um, and do a bit of processing on it. So for example, if you had a, a very high volume of requests on a certain, uh, sorry, from a certain IP address, um, a certain port, then you could perhaps um, block that port for a certain length of time or block that IP address, um, make firewall changes. Um, if you're running a, an elastic infrastructure on a cloud, for, in, for instance, you might want to um, increase your capacity um, if you would expect that sort of usage pattern. Uh, and finally, just as a, a brief summary of what we've covered today, um, we've seen what monitoring is from a Java perspective. Uh, we've seen how the JMX API makes a very large amount of operations data available um, and how that can com provide control for Java applications. Uh, I've talked about how John and RHQ use the JMX standard to great effect to allow gathering of metrics to see historical data on more subtle memory problems, um, how alerts can be configured to allow operations teams to proactively comply with service level agreements, uh, and to help in the diagnosis of some um, common and um, some quite important problems there. Now the key advantage of John is that all of this can be achieved in a highly scalable way. One large customer of, of C2B2s has implemented a John-based monitoring solution over hundreds of machines to monitor JMS transactions, uh, among other things. Um, and also, as we've seen, the metrics that are available are incredibly detailed, down to individual components of de deployed applications. 
Uh, and of course, finally, the biggest advantage to using John is that C2B2 can provide you with advanced technical support. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that RHQ is the unsupported flavor from the vendor, but we do offer support for both 